Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be talking about John and Lorena Bobbitt. Are you familiar? But before we get started, if you've not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can't do that unless you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. And now that I'm done basically begging you to join my cult, we can get into this, this video and whew, this story, man, this is a little different for my channel because, uh, you know, nobody dies and typically we discuss murders, but this is a wild one, man, that definitely falls under the true crime umbrella. And if you know, then you know, and if you don't get ready for a wild ride. I don't want to spoil the story for you if you by chance have not heard of this case. Um, it is a very famous case. Most people know about it even if you don't recognize the names associated with it. When you hear about the crime you probably will know and it's just completely insane from start to end from the infamous crime itself to the fact that both John and Lorena end up arrested separately, have two separate trials with two unexpected verdicts and there are also two very different narratives that were spun around what happened in this case and between this couple and then of course you know all of the the details kind of get lost in the sensational main act of this case. So I'm gonna tell you the whole story and while I do I'm gonna put on a face of makeup. Now if that's not your thing so sorry hope you find somebody who's more your speed thank you for sticking around this long but if you're on the fence and you're kind of like hmm that seems weird I don't know how I feel about that stick around you may be surprised by how much you like it. With that said, come gather around and let me tell you the infamous story of John and Lorena Bobbitt. Okay, so let's start with John and learn a little bit about his backstory so we can find out what type of person he is and why he is the way he is, at least to some extent. So we're gonna jump in our handy dandy time machine and head to New York in early 1967. John Bobbitt was born John Wayne Bobbitt on March 23rd in 1967, making him an Aries. He was born in New York to parents who had a less than ideal relationship where there was alleged abuse definitely between the parents and possibly with the kids as well. I couldn't find confirmation on whether or not there was abuse with the kids specifically, but either way, there definitely was between the parents and after a little bit of time, John's father eventually just dipped. He's like, this is not the life I want and he left his woman and his children. John's mother did the best she could to kind of have an ideal life or at least like a livable life for her and her sons. But after she separated from the boy's father, it got really difficult for her. She couldn't really afford to take care of the kids and they had to move to a less desirable neighborhood where things were pretty bad. John says he knows that it, on several occasions his mom was raped while they were living in that area. And he says that he was just attacked on the street and beaten up with no reason, which seems odd, but I mean, I don't know his life. This is what he said. And I believe this is a direct quote that they busted his head open. So the whole parenting thing and trying to, you know, keep her head above water ended up being too much for John's mother though. And eventually him and his two brothers were sent to live with their aunt and uncle alongside their four children. John's mother would show up and visit the kids on holidays, but she was overall mostly an absent parent once she gave the kids over to her family members. John said of all of this, and I quote, my mom couldn't take care of us three. She had a mental breakdown. She was a nice lady. She tried to take care of all three of us. She just couldn't do it. Once living with John's aunt and uncle, apparently things weren't really all daisies there either because he said once they moved in, the sexual abuse began. John never gave up the identity of who was sexually abusing him in the family. He didn't seem to say that it was either the aunt or the uncle that he lived with, but he did say that it was one of his uncles, somebody who was since dead and that he would get drunk and started sexually abusing the kids when they were less than 10 years old. We're going to fast forward a little bit now to young adult John. And when John was a young adult, he decided that he wanted to join the Marine Corps. And it was while at the Marine Corps ball, like, you know, how they have those things. I've heard of these things. Anyway, 
It was while there in 1988 that he met the woman, the woman whose name is in this title, the woman who the story is about, Lorena. Then Lorena Gallo. Now let's talk about Lorena a little bit. Lorena Gallo was born Lorena Leonor Gallo on October 31st, Halloween, that's tight, a Scorpio, 1969 or 1970. I saw it reported both ways and she was born in Ecuador. By all accounts, Lorena's childhood was described as being really great. She was born in Ecuador, but she was raised in Venezuela by two hardworking, loving parents alongside her two siblings. Lorena had been to the United States once as a teenager because it was her gift for her quinceanera. And once she went to the US, she fell in love with it and she wanted to move there. Her family even tried to legally immigrate, but they were unable to. But Lorena, still wanting to go to the US, ended up getting a student visa and came right on over by herself. When Lorena came over, she got odd jobs to try to support herself. She was a nanny for a while and she worked at a nail salon and she even ended up enrolling in a community college in Virginia, and she was still enrolled in this college when she met John Bobbitt. So once the duo met each other at this Marine Corps ball, they were immediately obsessed with each other, started dating right away, and John effectively became Lorena's very first boyfriend. Things seemed to be going pretty well in the relationship. Um, the two dated for only two years before they were married, and they were married on June 18th, 1989. Lorena was 20 years old, and John was 22. John says that the two ended up getting married because Lorena started to push him into marriage because her visa was going to expire and she wanted to stay in the country. But Lorena denies this. She says that John proposed to her and that her visa was never brought up as an issue. I don't know what the real reason was. Maybe a little column A, maybe a little column B. I mean, she did have a visa, so eventually it would expire. But John was also like... A military guy and statistically military men, if you look it up, they do tend to marry quicker and younger. So again, maybe a little column A, maybe a little column B. So the two were married in a small ceremony. John wore his Marine uniform and Lorena wore a white wedding dress. The couple ended up settling down in Manassas, Virginia, and they started in like a nice little modest studio apartment, but eventually moved into a nice luxury apartment that was probably just like a little bit above their means. By 1991, John had been discharged from the Marines and he was having trouble finding steady employment, which made it so that Lorena was like the main breadwinner. She was the one who had a job. She was the one bringing in all the money. Lorena was still working as a nanny for the owner of a local beauty shop. And that's actually, I believe, where she also worked as a manicurist as well. She ended up being promoted to a manicurist instead of just like a girl who worked there, like sweeping hair and all that shit. You know what I'm saying? Though the couple's relationship was seemingly filled with bliss when they first got together, which is often the case in the beginning of a relationship, you know, the honeymoon phase in the beginning, everything's roses, everybody's putting out the best version of themselves and not letting people see that you're a human being with flaws. Well, once the two were married, apparently John flipped a little switch. And this is also common predator behavior, if we're honest. I'm not, you know, opinion, you will form your own opinions, but I'm saying traditionally predators lull you in, lull you in by acting like the perfect person before finally flipping the switch little by little and showing who they really are. And now Lorena was in a situation where she was married. She was in a situation that she seemingly would not be able to escape from as easily as if they were dating. And he started to slowly but surely get abusive. It started with him just hitting her at the smallest little disagreement and progressed to him choking her in these fights and then eventually starting to rape her. It started slow with him just getting a little more violent in the bedroom, but eventually it was obvious that he was getting more and more excited the more violent the sex got. Things eventually ended up taking a dark turn when these activities became non-consensual. He would hit her, he would knock her to the floor, he would trap her, and then he would rape her. But of course, he denies that any of this ever happened. But Lorena says it did. At one point, Lorena even claims that she had become pregnant and that she was very excited at the idea of starting a family and being a mother, but that her husband, John, was not into it. And he told her that she wasn't made to be a mother, she wasn't cut out for the job, and threatened to leave her if she continued with the pregnancy and, in effect, forced her to get an abortion. 
And apparently while they were at the abortion clinic, he joked and he taunted her and told her that if she had gone through with this, she would have ended up dying anyways. Which is not what you need to hear while you're about to do something that you don't really want to do, something as personal as getting an abortion. But, you know. John says this is not what happened, that when he learned that they were pregnant, he just suggested that maybe they wait. John says that pretty much everything Lorena says is, is just bullshit, that he never hit her, he wasn't abusive, that the two definitely did fight, but it was Lorena who was the aggressor and that she would jump on him, like jump on his back and start hitting him. And he would, he said of this, and I quote, I mean, if we get in a fight and you jump on me and start hitting me and I try to subdue you, you're bound to get some sort of injury, like a bruise or a fat lip. John describes Lorena as being very obsessed with him and overprotective and an incredibly jealous woman. He says that he was not allowed to have any friends and she was the type of girl who would lose her mind if even another girl on the street just looked at him. That she saw him as sort of her meal ticket to the American dream and that she couldn't imagine living her life without him. That he was kind of, yeah, just like her meal ticket, even though it was her that was making all the money. During the course of the two's marriage, the cops were called to their residence at least a half dozen times. And in one of these instances, John even ended up arrested and he was charged with assault and battery. But then once he was arrested, he went and pressed charges on Lorena for assault and battery as well. And the two ended up just dropping the charges against each other. In hindsight, it just really seems like this relationship was headed for an explosion and should have stopped a lot sooner. But Hindsight is always 2020. The relationship always looks different when you're in it. Lorena has said that even though she was so unhappy and she was abused and she was battered and she was forced into submission, she didn't leave because she was Catholic. She didn't believe in divorce and therefore she didn't want to leave. Lorena didn't want a failed marriage. She thought the two would be able to work it out. She was of the mindset that with love, all things are possible, you know, that jazz. And plus her, her parents were an example for her because they had been married for many, many years. They were happy though. And she was just raised that you stick by your husband, you stick in the marriage and you make it work. Like that is what you do. So on June 21st, 1993, just two days before the infamous crime that brings us here today, Lorena was 24 and John was 26. And she actually did go in and try to obtain a protective order for her and against John. Lorena was told at that point that the paperwork would be written up that day. And that that afternoon there would actually be a hearing on her restraining order. But Lorena had plans that day to get lunch with a friend. So she told the, the court clerk, I'm assuming it was a court clerk, just based on like my job, but that's who I imagine that it would be filled out with. She told them that she wouldn't be able to make that afternoon hearing, that she would instead come back, not the next day, because she was also busy the next day, but that she would come back to sign the paperwork and have her hearing on that Wednesday, June 23rd, 1993, which is incidentally the day that this crime that we're talking about, just, just, just a couple minutes, took place. Apparently the court clerk asked her, like, aren't you afraid? Don't you want to get this filed as soon as possible? I mean, this is a protective order. Aren't you worried that something's going to happen? And Lorena said no, that she wasn't worried he was going to do anything that, you know, in the next two days because they had a friend who was staying with them and she didn't think her husband would hurt her while somebody else was in the house. Now, the version of events from that day that I just told you is from the, I believe, the statement of the actual court clerk, though Lorena says that this is not how it went down. Lorena says that when she went in, she told them or no, excuse me, that they told her that the papers wouldn't be ready for her signature and for the hearing until Wednesday, that she didn't choose that day. She was ready same day, but they told her that it couldn't be done that day. Now, I don't know who's telling the truth here and who's lying. Somebody's obviously not being truthful. Could it be the court clerk so that they're not responsible or liable for what ended up happening? Or is it Lorena so that she doesn't seem like she wasn't really afraid of her husband? I'm not really sure. I do know that with my particular line of work when it comes to law that if you want an emergency hearing there is at least 24 hours to wait because you need to be able to give notice to the other party to appear i don't do the type of law that like restraining orders things like that that might be different but either way there are different differing accounts of what happened with that so use your best judgment to make an opinion i guess either way the protective order never did get signed lorena never did go in to sign it and then then that the shit went down okay shit went down so the day before the night of the incident, 
John and a friend of his named Robert, the friend who had been staying at the house with them, because that was true, there was a friend staying at the house. Well, they decided they wanted to go out on the town, have some drinks, have some fun, just get out. Now, why was this guy Robert staying with them? Well, John says that Robert was staying with them because he had actually told Lorena that he wanted a divorce. And uh, while they were kind of figuring out who was going to move where, who was going to get what, Robert was there as sort of a mediator through this awful experience his friend was going through. So the two men went out, they had some drinks, they met up with some friends, John kind of showed Robert the area. They just had like a good night between the two of them. And when they showed up back home, it was a very early hour, early morning hours, and Lorena was already in bed, and she woke up to the sound of the door slamming when the two came back to the place. So John went upstairs to where Lorena was sleeping, and this is where we have two different accounts of what happened that night. At this point, it's after midnight, so it is officially Wednesday the 23rd. Lorena says that he came home, he was hammered drunk, that he jumped on top of her, ripped off her clothes, and raped her. But John says that when he came home, he wasn't even that drunk, that he was super, super tired from his night out, so that he just got in bed and tried to go to sleep, that it was Lorena that started making advances on him. He says that she was sort of, you know, talking in his ear, doing a little bit of groping, that the two maybe did a little bit of heavy petting, but that they never had sex and that he never raped her. And he says that he was too tired to respond to her verbally or sexually. He was just trying to go to bed. But he did also say of this that if the two did have sex that night and he didn't remember it, it's because he had sex in his sleep and that this is something that he did often. Question for the Brat Pack. Have any of you had sex in your sleep. And it's more, um, you know, how do I say this tactfully? You would be the one doing the work here. Have you done the work sexually in your sleep? Please tell me. Do you know what? Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I kind of want to know. After whatever happened that night, Lorena went downstairs to get a drink of water. She said that she felt numb. She felt embarrassed. She just felt pretty much nothing. She was in a haze. And this is when she noticed on the counter, a 10 inch kitchen knife was sitting there, just chilling, not killing. And this is when she picked it up and headed upstairs to their bedroom. Lorena has said of this moment, and I quote, it was so many things coming into my mind. I don't know how to describe it. Things like from the very first day he hit me, things about the abortion, things that when he was torturing me, when he was beating me up, when he has forced sex with me, everything. It just came so fast. This is when Lorena got upstairs into the bedroom. She pulled the sheets off of John Bobbitt and she cut that penis clean off his body. Just whoop, cut it off. So as I'm sure you can imagine, John wakes up in a bit of a panic. He's sitting there, penisless, bleeding, just screaming and he grabs like a like a blanket or something and starts applying pressure to the area and Lorena's just standing there in shock staring at him penis in one hand knife in the other and she's just standing there before her bleeding screaming husband and she's like I gotta go so she takes off she leaves the house with the penis with the knife gets in her car and books it and keep in mind that while this is happening all this is happening Robert sleeping on the couch while well, all of this took place. So Robert ends up actually being the one that took John to the, to the hospital. So Lorena, probably just shitting her pants, is driving in her car and she, she's got the penis with her. And at one point she said that she didn't even realize she had it in her hand until she was like trying to drive and realize it's there. So she's like, what am I, what am I supposed to do here? Okay, and this is when, mm -hmm. this is when Lorena looks out her window and she sees an open field. So she kind of looks at the field, looks at the penis, looks back at the field and straight yeets that penis into an abandoned field. Kobe, like bro, just like, bye. People, that's a, whew. So police show up to the apartment and when they get there, they see a blood trail headed from the parking area into the apartment. When police arrive, the house is already empty. I'm pretty sure Lorena was on the loose, John, was at the hospital. So they're just kind of there to look at the crime scene and find the elusive penis. Inside the apartment, they end up finding, you know, a lot of blood, obviously, but they also end up finding pamphlets on domestic violence and rape. 
Now, some people believe that these pamphlets were in the house because Lorena was looking up information to, to frame John and make him look like a rapist and a domestic abuser, but others are of the mindset, and I think I lean this way for sure, that Lorena was just trying to, to figure out if this is what he was doing because, I mean, she wasn't from this country. She may not have known the laws on what was legal and what wasn't, especially between married people, and we'll find out that he did have some protection there, at least in the state at the time. And maybe she had confided in a friend and been like, this is what's happening. They're like, bro, like, this isn't okay. This is rape. This is abuse. And she was looking into it to confirm if that was true and find out her options. That's kind of where I lean. So while this is all happening, while police are searching the home for evidence and while John lay in the hospital waiting for something to happen, Lorena actually shows up and turns herself in. So police had some questions, obviously, and the first one was, um, where, where's the penis? Because John, who's in the hospital right now, by the way, would very much like to um, reattach it to his body. And that's just like, man, doesn't that need to be on ice or something? I thought that when you had something amputated, it needed to be on ice like right away. I'm, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a doctor. So she's like, I'm not exactly sure. I'm pretty sure I threw it into this field. So they head over to the field and they start doing a search. And this is where they do find the separate penis. And they also find the knife that was used in a trash can nearby. So on instruction from the hospital, police run to a 7-Eleven next door to get some ice and they also get a a big bite box, which if you have a 7-Eleven near you, you may know a big bite is a hot dog. So it's like a hot dog box, okay? And they put the ween on ice in the hot dog box to transport to the hospital. Once the, the peen arrives at the hospital, the doctors, after nine hours of surgery, were able to successfully reattach John's member. And it was to the point that it was almost fully functional. And John Bobbitt was very lucky because according to one of the doctors who worked on him, penile replantation is extremely rare. So while John is in the OR getting reattached, Lorena is in the same hospital in another area having a rape kit done. And it was determined in doing that rape kit that Lorena had had sexual intercourse that very night, which is weird because John said the two never had sex at all. So Lorena was arrested and she ended up being charged with malicious wounding that came with not only a sentence of 20 years in prison, but also deportation. Lorena pled not guilty due to temporary insanity, and John was also arrested, and he was charged with marital assault, not rape, because, get this, Virginia law at that time made it so that for it to be considered marital rape, either the couple had to have been separated at the time, like living in separate dwellings, or during the commission of the assault, there had to have been serious bodily harm inflicted. And that's the only way it could be considered marital rape. Okay. Um, because they're married. Anyways, uh, he pled not guilty. The media, of course, went crazy with this. I mean, she legitimately cut his penis off. I mean, <laughs> what do you expect, to be honest? People made it like a media circus, dude. They were more focused on what happened and not why it happened. One radio station even ended up serving outside of the courthouse um, hot dogs because phallicness, and also sliced soda, which is the orange soda, but sliced because of uh, his member being sliced off. But alongside all the people who took, um, you know, the whole story as a joke, there were also just tons of supporters that came out to support Lorena, because though she did do something terrible, she was seen as a woman who was suffering from domestic abuse, who had been backed into a corner and had finally just like snapped and lashed out at her abuser. So, of course, everyone wanted to be part of this case. They wanted to be in the courtroom when it happened. They were very interested in it. But for John's uh, trial, because it involved sexual abuse, there were no cameras allowed in the courtroom. So, as I believe I said in the beginning, the two had separate trials. So, for John's trial, where he was, uh, you know, being put on trial for spousal abuse, spousal assault, whatever, not rape, um, him and his defense team tried to paint Lorena as a psychopath. That This was a woman who was unhinged. She was setting him up. She was the aggressor. She was the violent one. I mean, look at what she had done to him. And for Lorena's case, her team was like, no, he raped her. He abused her. He kept her in submission because he knew she wouldn't leave. And then she just snapped. 
witnesses reported at her hearing that they had seen bruises on Lorena's body throughout, you know, the years that they were together and that she had even told them that it was John who was putting them on her even before this ever happened. And there were also witnesses that reported hearing John's brag about liking to force sex on his wife. They were basically saying that John was a woman beater, John was an abuser, and Lorena was a battered woman who finally just snapped. You want to know what's completely wild about these two hearings, these two trials, these two separate cases? Both of them were found not guilty. John was straight up acquitted. They didn't think he was guilty of spousal abuse, assault, whatever they want to call it. And Lorena was found not guilty due to temporary insanity. And she was ordered to spend five weeks in a psychiatric hospital to be evaluated. Because apparently this was the law in Virginia that you had to stay five weeks if you were found to be temporarily insane. After her five weeks, she was released and deemed not a threat to herself or to anyone else. Of course, Lorena then filed for divorce, which was um, completed in 1995 after six years of marriage and thus ended the tumultuous relationship between John and Lorena Bobbitt. But the story does not end there, dude. We need to talk about the aftermath a little bit. We need to do a little like, where are they now segment or where were they a little bit ago after the crime happened? Because bro, some of this shit is absolutely crazy, particularly with John, but man, whew, I want to tell you guys about it because it's ridiculous. Let's start with John. So John ended up really taking advantage of the fame that this case brought him. Maybe he thought he was owed that because of what happened to him. I don't know, but he ended up going on a like um, a 40 city media tour where he would just talk about what happened, talk about who he was, just kind of milk the entire situation. He even ended up starting like a satirical band at least I believe it was satirical just based on like the name of the band and the lack of talent there. But well, that's rude. Maybe they were very talented, but during this media tour, this band would play and they were called the severed parts. <laughs> okay, John. He also, okay guys, you can't make this shit up. He also ended up wanting to take full advantage of his almost fully functioning penis and dude, he got in to the porn industry. He ended up meeting, um, he met Ron Jeremy at a Playboy party in Las Vegas, like a Playboy bunny party. And him and Ron really hit it off and Ron even offered him a job. He went on to do adult films. <sighs> I'm sorry, I can't do this. He went on to do adult films with names such as John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut and my personal favorite that I literally cannot get over and it is Franken penis. Franken penis, okay? I also did read that he had at some point had some sort of surgery to like not to like make it bigger, like a penal enlargement surgery, but honestly, I didn't look as far into it because once I heard Franken penis, I was like, I've learned all I need to know, I'm done, nothing can top that. And um apparently people in the industry just described this little ween as looking like a crooked Coke can. So that's the image I want to leave you with. Sorry, but if I have to have that image, you have to have that image. Okay, wait, 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 I'm sorry. There is one more thing I have to tell you about the, um, the, uh, the porn penis. Well, <laughs> one of the doctors who had worked on reattaching the penis back to John's body said that he had to watch the films because, and I quote, it's not often our surgical work is displayed in that fashion. I couldn't not see it. It's my work. I, I promise you I'm about to get more serious because like, here's the thing. Am I going to be 33 years old this year? Yes, I am. Am I mature enough for this subject matter? <gasps> no, I am not. But for you, I will pretend to be. Anyways, after all of this happened, John actually ended up filing for bankruptcy, right? So the doctors who helped reattach his ween never actually got paid for it. So that was really nice of him. And apparently John's just like an overall piece of crap. And we're going to get into that a little bit in a second. But uh, after all this happened, he was still strangely hung up on Lorena also, which I found to be particularly interesting. Apparently he would still send her cards and letters and said that he loved her and would still try to keep in contact with her. I don't know if he still does, but he did for at least a while. But Lorena was not about it. And good for Lorena, because she definitely dodged a bullet, which I'm sure she knew she was dodging a bullet, considering what she had gone through, because John ended up having some trouble with the law. He had a couple of run-ins with the law for, guess what it was? Beating on women. A few women, actually. 
he had even supposedly taken one of his ex-girlfriends, tied her to a bed, and raped her several times. So this guy was just a giant loser, and what he went through didn't really change that. Allegedly. Now let's discuss Lorena a little bit. Lorena, after the incident, did go back to her normal life, just being a manicurist, and she did end up becoming an American citizen, so good for Lorena. Uh, she wasn't all about the spotlight like, spotlight like John was, and she ended up even being offered um, a deal with Playboy, which she turned down, and I believe this deal was for about a million dollars, and she still turned it down. She did finally end up making a documentary about her experience called Lorena that was lit that was directed by Jordan Peele. And I haven't seen this yet. I do not know where to find it, but I really want to watch it because I love Jordan Peele. So if you know where I can see it, please let me know. Correction, I just referred to my notes and it says that it was produced by Jordan Peele. So I don't know if he wrote it or if he directed it. Either way, if Jordan Peele's involved, I would like to also be involved. Lorena did end up getting into a serious relationship with a new man and had a daughter and hopefully she's being treated better in that relationship than she was in the relationship with John. She also has spent the last like several years being an advocate against domestic violence. She also goes by her maiden name now, as I'm sure you can imagine, Lorena Gallo, and she started a foundation called the Lorena Gallo Foundation. She said that she wanted to start a place like this because when she was in her marriage, she didn't realize that she had the option to seek refuge in a shelter like this to help her escape the abuse she was being, like, that she was being given, being given, I don't think that's the right word, but at the hands of John. She said of this, and I quote, As an immigrant woman, I was often too scared to call the police for help. My abusive husband always threatened that he could have the police detain me and have me deported back to my country. Lorena was, and probably honestly still is, seen by many as a crazy and jealous woman, but due to her case, alongside some other cases like the Nicole Brown Simpson case, laws did end up changing and Congress even passed the Violence Against Women Act. So obviously they considered her case to be serious. And that, my friends, is the crazy story of John and Lorena Bobbitt. What do you think? I feel like when I went into this case initially, before I had done any research, just based on what I had heard growing up, I went into this case thinking I felt a certain way. I felt before that, like, because John had been acquitted, that there must have been something that was presented that proved that maybe Lorena had been lying or exaggerating. But then when I started looking into this case, and I saw, you know, the history behind it, how the cops had been called, and just how much, okay, the burden of proof that was needed at that time in Virginia to prove marital rape, which is just ridiculous. First off, why is marital rape considered difference, different than rape? Rape is rape. You know, and I just, I see things differently now, like completely differently as an adult and with all of the information. Um, and that guy for sure should have gone to jail, in my opinion. He was clearly a predator and his track record after the fact showed, showed that he clearly liked hurting women, beating women, tying women up, raping women. I believe that these things happened to Lorena and I believe that he chose her specifically. I saw in an article him talking about the very first time he saw her and he described her as either shy or quiet, very timid, very cute, very small, couldn't speak English. And I think he preyed on her specifically for those reasons. I wasn't in the relationship, obviously, but I got the impression that he didn't really love her, that he just loved controlling her. I think that he, um, I think, I think he saw this girl and I think he was like, oh, I can control her. I can manipulate her. I can make her do whatever I want. And she's not going to know what she can do to get out of it. And that's just my opinion based on what I have seen. But of course, please tell me what yours is. We're allowed to have a difference of opinion as long as it's respectful, right? We can do that. We're adults, most of us. And if we're not, we are all human beings and know how to be decent. Do I think she was a saint? No, I do not. I did read some things that did show that she did have a little bit of feist in her and maybe had some things that made her not perfect, which I didn't mention in this video because I didn't think they were pertinent to the actual situation. It was just attacking her character because at the end of the day, I do believe that she was victimized. With that said, I don't think what she did to John was okay. I'm not saying that that's okay. I know there's some people out there who see her as a hero for what she did. I don't think that's okay, but I also don't think she made a conscious decision to do what she did. So what do you think? Is there anyone out there that believes John's version of events? I would like to know. No judgment. I would just like you to 
present your case to me so I can maybe see if you can if you can make me feel a little differently. I doubt it, but I would like to hear what you have to say. I am open to being wrong. Either way, it's a wild story. I'm, you know, I'm glad that Lorraine is okay. I'm glad she got out of the relationship. I hope that she's doing better for herself all around and making a better life for herself. And I'm glad to see that she is an advocate for something that's important to her. And John, well, I hope that he dies alone, not to be dramatic. I just hope he doesn't end up with any other woman because he has a track record of not treating them very well. Um, and plus, you know, he seems like a dick and he has a Franken penis. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that you found it interesting and informative and you were able to take something away from this. I hope I gave you all the information that you would want in a way that made sense. Um, and I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering this case with me today, revisiting it a little. Um, I'm sure a lot of you had already heard of it, so I hope that I was able to at least, you know, do it justice or maybe give you some new information or new perspective on what happened. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below, because as you know, I have a very long list of cases that I want to cover, but every time you leave a case suggestion, I add it to my list to look into and I put your name next to it so I can give you a shout out, because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste, otherwise you would not be here. Of course, please join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. You can subscribe, like, thumbs up, share, all that stuff is very helpful for my channel and I would love if you would do it. And of course, if you want to follow me more consistently on social media, everything is linked down below for your convenience along with like all the makeup I use, the earrings I'm wearing, the nail polish, in case you want to know what color this is because it is beautiful. It's all down there for your convenience. And with that said, thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.